In the name of God, in whom we live and move and have our very being, even to the end of time. Amen. It's 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning in late May, and here we are at St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral, gathered in the same space in which just two years ago, last Friday, the Reverend Canon John Retker preached his final sermon, sitting right there actually recording it. You'll recall we were fresh into COVID. He recorded his final sermon right in that space, right there in front of the Paschal candle, on what was then the 60th anniversary of his ordination in the Church of God. 60 years a priest, he said, you can do the math. Got to be about 25 to be ordained. So that makes me very, very, very old indeed. Now the actual anniversary of John's ordination was on the 14th of May, but he was always much more committed to the feast day than to the date itself, a reality he contended had everything to do with the nature of the feast and the content of the bishop's sermon that spring day in 1960 on the open plains of south-central Saskatchewan. In a location lacking any recognizable topographical character, in which one could see the horizon, meet the heavens, uh, between earth and heaven for miles in every direction, John was particularly struck that exact day. He was struck that exact day by the possibility of being lifted with Christ so thoroughly into those open skies that he might inadvertently, in his ministry, neglect the cares and the concerns of the afflicted and the earthbound. To remedy what John confessed to be his own tendency to focus on glory and the mysterious and to neglect the ordinary tasks of everyday life, the bishop that day made a point to charge Dora, John's beloved partner and life's partner in crime and ministry, let's be honest, Dora, with the task, difficult as it was, no doubt, over a lifetime together of keeping his feet firmly on the ground. It's not the going up that is the focus, John would say, but Christ himself, no longer bound by the grave, but alive and now free to fill all things, both in the heavens and here on earth. This feast day, he admitted, asks us to believe the unbelievable, that nothing in all of life nor among the many powers of death can separate us from the love of God in Christ, whose broken, glorified body has not only harrowed hell, but also broken wide the gates of eternity, rending forever the apparent veil between heaven and earth, between spirit and matter, between the extraordinary and the mundane. John's was a sacramental view of life in which everything held the possibility, even the likelihood, of revelation. His own intimate experience of both the sublime and the tragic assured the enchanted world he inhabited was more complex than sentimental, more comedic than precious. His was the hard-earned emotional disposition of a hopeful realist, well-studied in heartbreak and human pathology, more apt to laugh than to cry, but not by much. As Auden said, the roots of wit and charm tap secret springs of sorrow. And he knew it well. For those of us who didn't have the pleasure of knowing John, he was a loving husband and father, grandfather, closet cartoonist. He was a dedicated aficionado of the arts. He was a faithful pastor. He was a priest who revealed the holy to us. He was an inviting and self-deprecating preacher. He was a convicting prophet known to whistle his favorite hymnody wherever and whenever the acoustics were just right. In fact, if I remember correctly, he briefly officed with us downstairs, and we had to knock on the walls to get him to turn it down. He brought joy and comfort to those suffering, strength and encouragement to those who are striving, uproarious laughter to all of those celebrating. He was truly a man of life's every season, 
and his deep solidarity with us in whatever state he found us grew naturally from his own full cycle of life's good times and bad. He lived both unguarded and unafraid. He was convinced of life's lasting victory over death. No need to run, no need to hide, open to life on life's terms, a friend and faithful companion to those of us still struggling along the way. And he would cheer us on, sitting right over there in what I've come to understand is known as the Society of St. George, because of the window y'all can see. He'd sit right over there, and he would nod approvingly, even if he didn't agree with what you're saying, he would just try to get you through your sermon. <laughs> he would lean forward and nod approvingly, like, let's keep it going. He would smile, and he'd offer always a kind and constructive word. Now, having himself been freed from sin and death, he made it his life's work to extend that same liberating love to others in quiet, unseen, and often unnoticed ways. And we have, each of us here, been touched in some way by his witness to the risen life in which we all share by faith. Now, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they live their final days, particularly how they affect those with whom they're privileged to spend those precious waning hours. John spent a number of those final hours over at the university hospital, tending to the staff in Unit 6C. Sure, they were there to watch his vitals, to manage his meds, to feed and bathe him, to keep him comfortable, but let's be honest, he was there to assure them that there was nothing to fear in the ordeal he was enduring, death being as essential to life as birth, each a type of ending, each a type of new beginning. The charge nurse on the morning of his discharge, through tears of gratitude, told me how he'd explained to the medical team on the day of his arrival, well, you know, sure, I'm dying, but... Let's be honest, I've been dying since the day I was born. They were speechless. Now, he said this not flippantly, but faithfully, deeply grounded in the conviction that our God is trustworthy, promising eternity to those who, well, trust. Amidst all our strivings and struggles, John reminds us to keep it simple to hope and to aspire for sure, to keep our eyes ever attentive to the far horizon of our present challenges, but also to embrace the glorious possibilities of the moment ever before us, feet firmly planted on the terra firma of this place, of this time, with these people, living in the shadow of death, no doubt, yet led by a loving God to lie down in green pastures beside still waters, there's nothing left to fear for those who choose to dwell in the heart of the Lord forever. This, this is God's promise to us. God's promise to John. And he believed it. He believed it with every fiber of his being. It was a belief that made his sharing in Christ's victory over death not only believable, to others, but visible. It was actionable. It was shareable. Deeply infectious joy, confidence, and the peace that only a faith like that can give. This, today, and every burial liturgy is an Easter liturgy. Not because death is denied, but because death is overcome. Our beloved has been raised with Christ to live in the nearer presence of God for eternity. And from that heavenly throne, John, now resting with the angels and risen with the saints, whispers quietly back to each and every one of us through song and sacrament. Dear friends, fear not, for life is changed, not ended. Though absent in body, I am with you even to the end of the ages. 
on this Feast of the Ascension today, we may be apt to join with the apostles standing and staring into the heavens, hoping to catch one last glimpse of our departing beloved. And we may be surprised to find ourselves staring heavenward for some time to come, seeking signs of our beloved's return. But in John's mind, this betrays the point of the occasion altogether. You see, it's the leave-taking from some things that allows him now to be present to us in all things, not merely in the heavens, but so too here on the earth, in which every sight and sound, taste and smell now bears the possibility of revelation. John's real presence made manifest in our remembering, doing these things, enduring these things, laughing at these things, rejoicing in these things, all to the end that we remain together forever, bound by a love that changes but does not end. Now from this spot right here, two years ago, in the final words of his final sermon, John gives us this final assurance. We call upon the Holy Spirit to come to us, to dwell in us, to warm our hearts, to give us strength for the journey. We may not be as rich as we'd like. We may not have the body we'd like. We may not have the brains we'd like. But we do have this, a conviction that when all is said and done, when we follow Jesus, we will not be disappointed. We will not be disappointed. It is exactly as he promised if we keep our feet on the ground. And so here we stand, John, honoring you with our feet firmly planted in this place at this time with these people, all of which you have loved so well and have now entrusted to us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done.